In this lecture, we're going to talk about the SPICE circuit simulation program. I'm going to start with some introductory slides, and then most of the lecture will be spent working through examples on the computer. We'll be using SPICE in the next few homeworks, so I encourage you to pay attention and to work along with the examples. Up until now, we've done analytical calculations on ideal components. That is, we have perfect resistors, capacitors, inductors, voltage, and current sources. And in addition to that, we've made approximations. We've analyzed our LC circuits at resonance or far from resonance, either critically, either very overdamped or very underdamped. The real world is much more complicated. Real components have non-ideal properties. Inductors have resistances, capacitors and inductors have other losses related to dielectrics and permeable material, and a lot of important elements are nonlinear. In particular, uh, diodes, transistors, and other semiconductors have extremely nonlinear responses and can't be analyzed analytically. Devices can also have very complex frequency and temperature dependence. These things affect not only the discrete components, which we could in principle build and test, but the inner workings of integrated circuits, in particular processors, memory chips, etc., which have to be understood before they can be fabricated. Therefore, numerical simulation is a critical part of the electronic design process. SPICE stands for Simulation Program with Integrated Circuit Emphasis. That doesn't really tell you a lot, but the original was written in Fortran at UC Berkeley by Lawrence Nagel under the direction of his advisor, Donald Peterson. The first official release was in 1973. It was based on models for individual components and a netlist syntax defining how they were connected together. The input was via text commands, which originally were entered on computer punch cards. The capabilities have grown dramatically over the years, and there are now many versions. It remains the most common simulation engine for circuits, but today it's usually embedded into other programs that shield the user from the details of the input. For example, you will usually have a graphical user interface where you draw a schematic, uh, picking uh, parts from a library of parts. That is then translated to a netlist that SPICE interprets, simulates, and then the output is passed back to the graphical user interface. SPICE can do many things, but we're going to focus on three classes of simulations. The first is the operating point analysis, and the SPICE command is .op. That's simply solving Kirchhoff's equations to get static voltages and currents, as we did in the early lectures. The second is the transient analysis with the command .tran. That analyzes the time domain behavior in which the circuit responds to initial conditions and or a variety of time-dependent driving waveforms. Then we look at the circuit as a function of time, just like we would on an oscilloscope. And the final are AC analysis. That does the frequency domain response of the circuit uh, using the command .ac, and that's applicable to the complex impedance sort of calculations we've done with uh, filters uh, in the last few lectures. So here I'm giving an, an example of the most basic type of command-driven SPICE simulation. I'm making a circuit here that has a 10 volt voltage source, a 100 ohm resistor, and a 10 microfarad capacitor. So the time constant of this circuit is R times C, or 1,000 microseconds, one millisecond. Um, I'm labeling the nets here, giving them names, and the net name zero is reserved for ground. You always have to define a ground point in a SPICE simulation. So here I'm setting up the simulation. Components are identified by the first letter. So a voltage source is a V, R is a resistor is an R, a capacitor is a C, and what follows is a name. Uh, long ago it could only be a number, but now it can be anything. So the voltage source I'm calling in, resistor one, capacitor one. I then define how it connects to the nets. Now I don't have to define the nets because the nets are created at the moment I give their name here. So here I say the voltage source is from net one to net zero with the syntax being that the positive point is the first net listed and it has a 10 volt value. The resistors and capacitors and everything else go in the direction of current. So I'm going from point one to point test point and it has a value of 100 ohms. The capacitor goes from test point back to ground and has a value of 10 micro ohms. I could have, uh, micro farads. I could have written that as, one, as 10 e to the minus sixth, but the u prefix is understood to mean micro, whereas the m prefix means milli. I then have to give it some initial conditions, which I could have done on the line where I created the capacitor, uh, but I'm just going to say the initial condition here is that the voltage at test point is zero volts, which sets zero charge on the capacitor. Um, if I, so I want to time, 
analyze the time dependent behavior of this. And since there's a one millisecond time constant, five milliseconds seems like a reasonable uh, time to model it for. So I do a transient analysis from in five microsecond increments out to 5,000 microseconds, or I could have written 5m there as well. Now this part of the input would be understood by any version of SPICE. The next part is a control block, and that's really only understood by the text interface versions of SPICE, and I'm using ng SPICE. Uh, the graphical user interface versions, you would give these commands through the graphical user interface. So in this case, I tell it to run the simulation that does all the calculations and puts the results into vectors. Then I tell it to plot the voltage at the test point. Then I want to plot the current, and these really simple versions of SPICE don't store the current, so I actually can specify mathematical equations on the plot command, and this tells this calculates the current. I take the voltage at point one minus the voltage at test point and divide by 100. And then I run this in the program and I get the output. And what I see here is one plot that has the voltage, which of course ramps from the initial condition of zero up to 10 volts, and we see that the one millisecond time constant looks about right. Here I'm plotting the current. It didn't know what I was plotting, so it just says milli units. So this is 100 milli units, or 0.1 amps. I have 10 volts over 100 ohms, so it starts at 0.1 amps and decays to zero, again with a one millisecond time constant. SPICE uses component models, and the ideal components are built in. You don't have to tell it what a resistor or a voltage source is. But it can incorporate very sophisticated models for uh, other things, including the parasitic properties of those ideal components. It can include nonlinear behavior, frequency dependence, temperature dependence, time dependence. Essentially, anything that can be functionally represented can be incorporated into the model for the component. And most importantly, uh, all commercial electronics components have SPICE models. If you buy an electronic component, you can go somewhere and download the SPICE model. Here's an example of a basic transistor. This is a 2N22A, which we'll be using in lab in a couple of weeks. Um, you see here the model for that. Now, you don't need to worry about the details of all these parameters. I just want you to notice that there are a lot of them. This is what it takes to fully model the behavior of this transistor. And the idea is that if I build a SPICE model using this model of the transistor, it will behave exactly the way the transistor does in a circuit. Um, we're not going to talk about models today. We'll get to a simple models a little later in the quarter. As I said, there's many versions of SPICE. Uh, I'm not going to list them all. Some of the most common are P-SPICE, which is kind of the industry standard. It's incorporated as part of the ORCAD design package, and it costs a lot of money. Um, NG-SPICE is the free open source version. It's the most generic. It's the one I used for that example. It's text entry only but it's used as the basis for other uh, graphical user interface systems. For example, um, EasyEDA is a free web-based GUI. Um, that is, you enter the schematic in a schematic capture way uh, on a web browser, and then in the background, it's analyzed with ng-spice. It also has a PC board layout. It's nice, but because you, all of these programs are running on a central computer, they limit the number of simulations you can do as well as the number of points. For example, you can only do a thousand points in a time simulation, and you can only do one time simulation every two minutes. And that gets very frustrating, particularly when you're trying to debug your, your code. So we're going to use a version called LT Spice. It's free, supported by analog devices. It's kind of the most standard free version. Uh, it's available for Mac and Windows, and you can install the Windows version under Linux using Wine. Uh, it's got a graphical user interface, but it can also use text-based files, which we'll use for a couple of examples. Now we're going to go on to work through some examples on the computer. Uh, I'm going to do the first one using both the Windows and the Mac version. The Windows version has more, as you'll see, has a little better user interface, but I'm going to give most of the uh, examples using the Mac version because that technique will work on both. You should be able to figure out how to use the tools on the Windows version if that's the one you're using. As I said, we'll be doing this in homework uh, in a, the coming week, so I encourage you to work along with the examples. Now we're going to do the circuit simulation that we discussed in the introduction using LT Spice. So here's the circuit we want to simulate. I've brought up the PC version of the Spice of LT Spice from a 
uh, virtual Windows machine on the right, uh, that one just pops right up. I'm going to launch the Macintosh version here, and that one you have to say you're starting a new blank schematic. Now, one thing you'll notice is that the even though it's the same program, the interface is very different. The Windows machine it has a lot of buttons in the menu that'll let you draw simple objects straight from the menu bar, whereas the Macintosh version is pretty terse. Uh, most of the examples I'll use the Macintosh version, uh, you access most things with right clicks. Uh, you can do that with the PC version as well, but you can also use the toolbar. Now for the first version, we're going to use text entry uh, for the first example. and uh, I really, there isn't a good text editor within the program, so I'm just going to use a uh, text wrangler. You can use whatever your favorite uh, text entry pr program is. And uh, remember that the first line is just a comment, so this is going to be an RC circuit. And then we start to draw the elements. Uh, remember that voltage sources start with V. I'm calling it V in. Uh, I don't have to define the net names. As soon as I use a net name here, it's automatically defined within SPICE. So I called this one and it goes to zero. Zero is reserved for ground and it has a value of 10 volts. The resistor goes from net one to the net I'm calling test point. And again, it's defined at the moment I type it here. And that has a value of 100 ohms. C1 goes from test point back to ground and has a value of 10 microfarads, where u is this unit for micro. And if you remember, I have to define the initial conditions, which is that the voltage at the test point is equal to zero volts at the beginning. And then I tell it the type of analysis I want to do, which is a transient analysis in five microsecond increments out to five milliseconds. Now, I'm not going to give it the run commands here in the text file because LT Spice doesn't understand them from the graphical user interface. So now I want to save the file. And we normally save netlist as either .cir or .net. And I'm going to save it and overwrite a previous version. And then I can close the text file. So at this point, I can read in the file. And I run it by clicking this little running man. When I do that, a plot appears, but it has no traces because I haven't asked it to plot any traces. So I go to this Add Traces menu, and I can add the voltage at the test point. And unlike the simple text version, this stuff does actually store the current. So I can also plot the current. And then when I say, oh, we see, OK, we see both of them. So there's the voltage rises asymptotically from 0 to 10 volts, and the current falls asymptotically from 100 milliamps back to 0. Now, if I open the file from the PC version, you've got to be a little careful because that has a file type. And the first time you run it, it will probably be looking for schematics, so it won't even see the text file you just saved. So you have to specifically tell it to look for net files or .cir files, and we read that in. And here we run it by clicking the little running man. For some reason, I always seem to have to click him twice. And the same thing happens. Uh, here I can add traces from the visible traces option under plot settings and to select multiple traces I can do a control. So I can do test print, test point, and control I and I plot them and I get the same plot as you would expect. Um, so both versions run the same. This will probably be the last example we do with simple text entry. The next example will involve schematic capture. Now we're going to enter the same circuit using schematic capture. I'm going to use the Macintosh version of the program. As I showed you before, the PC version has some shortcut menu items that are pretty intuitive, but the way I show you how to do it on the Mac will work on both. So first we bring up the program. We say we start a new blank schematic. Now all of the commands are addressed through right click. And almost everything we do is going to be on the draft menu. And that's going to include components, wires, net names, and spice directives. So the first thing we're going to do is right-click, draft, component, and we'll put in the voltage source. Now, when I say right-click, draft, component, I get a list of all the components, and I can start to type a name. When I type V, it actually brings up a type of diode, but then voltage will bring up 
a voltage source. So I'm going to place the voltage source. Now once I've selected a component, it's going to keep placing them until I right click to get out of that menu. So if I want to get rid of these, then I do edit, delete, and I can click on the ones I don't want. Now I'm going to add the resistor. So I do component, I type R and I see a resistor, so I hit OK. Now I can rotate it before I place it by hitting Control R. But if I forget to do that and place it, then the only way I can change the orientation is to do an edit drag. I click on it once to select it, then I'm moving it around. And while I'm moving it, I can hit Control R. and place it. Okay, now I'll place the capacitor. Right click, draft, component, C, and we'll put the capacitor here. And again, right click to get out of the placement menu. Uh, now I'm going to draw some wires. Draft, wires. Now if I start at one at a point of one component, I go in a direction, clicking, left clicking will let me switch direction, and then the wire will end when I hit another component. So I do left click, drag, not a drag, just a move, left click, move, left click on the component, and then I'll do left click, move, left click, move, left click. Now in a SPICE simulation, I always have to define the ground point. So the way I do that is with a right click, draft, net name, it's a little confusing, and I pick ground, and I place that. And then I draw a wire to it. So that defines that net to be net zero. Now I can name all the nets, but the only one I really care about is this one called test point. So I'm going to right click on it, hit label net, and give it the name test point. Okay, so now I have to give my components values. So I right click on them, and you'll see that comes down, and I'll say that has a DC value of 10 Volts. Now notice I can also give it other attributes like resistances to make it more realistic, but I'm not going to do that. Uh, same with resistor. I right click on it, give it the value of 100 ohms. And the capacitor, I right click on it and give it a value of 10 microfarads. Now notice you right click on it at the point the little hand appears. Now at this point, I'll tell it, I could tell it to run a simulation but I haven't actually told it what to do. So the way I add spice directives to this is right click, draft, spice directive, and then I can enter those little specific directives. And my two directives were the initial condition directive that tells it that that voltage at test point is zero, and then control return and I tell it to do a transient analysis in five microsecond instrument increments for five milliseconds. And I can just place that somewhere on the screen. Uh, before I do the simulation, I'll save it in case something goes wrong. And so I'm saving that as a schematic, and that will be example. Now I run the simulation. And the same thing happens before, as before. I select the traces that I want to display, and I'm displaying the voltage and the current. I plot them, and we see that we get them just like before. That's it for this example but we'll show a few more complex examples in the next portion.
For our next example, we're going to do an operating point analysis of this circuit that we solved uh, early in the quarter. Um, if you remember, if you go back to the basic circuits lecture on page 15, we went through this and we solved for the currents. We got 1 amp, 0.5 amps, and 1.5 amps, and that made these two voltages 35 volts and 15 volts. Now we're going to do that same circuit with spice. So we bring up the program. I put in a current source component, current. Notice I type the name, not the symbol. I type CU for current, not I. That would get me so that would get me an inductor. So I select that. Now you notice it's actually pointed in the wrong direction. So I'm going to hit Control R to rotate it upwards. Right click to get out of that. Make I'm going to make that screen a little bigger. Okay, now I want to put in my voltage source. I'm going to go ahead and put in my um, ground point, which remember is kind of non-intuitive. It's the net name option. Put that there and we're just going to put a ground point right, right there. And now I'll put in all my resistors. And I'm going to put them in order that I've labeled the currents on that plot. I could always change the names later if I want to. And I have to rotate the one in the middle. Okay, now I'll put in all my wires. Now I'm going to go through and give my components values. Now you have to be careful to put it on the component where you get that little finger. That'll let you edit the value. If you put it over here, it'll let you edit the name. See, I could change the name of it. So make sure you're editing the right thing. So here I'm going to give it a 1 amp as the current. Give this a value of 20 ohms. Give this a value of 10 ohms. give this a value of 10 ohms as well, and set this to be 20 volts. Now I'm going to go ahead and label the nets as well. I don't really have to do that, but just so I know what they are. And remember that this ground net is always zero. So I'm going to label this net 1, 2, Okay, it's usually a good idea to save circuits unless you made in case you made a mistake. Uh, that if the program crashes, you don't want to want to lose them. So now I'm going to give it my uh, spice commands, which again I do by doing draft spice directive, and in this case the directive is simply dot op for operating. And I click, I'm going to save it. I'm going to click Run. Now, a plot pops up in, with nothing in it. If you're running the PC version, at this point, an output would pop up with the solution to the circuit. On the Mac, it's a little tricky to find it. You have to hit right click, View, Spice Error Log, and then you get the solution. Now, you notice it finds the voltages correctly. And it finds the right value for the current. Here's the current flowing through R1, here's the current flowing through R2, but the sign is different. Uh, and that's because it creates its netlist, and here if we do view spice netlist, it defined R3, for example, as going 
from point 0 to point 2 rather than point 2 to point 0. So it's defining a positive current to be this way and the current really goes this way. Um, there's really no way to override this. I can't edit, I can put in a spice file, but I can't edit it once it's been created by a schematic. So the other way I can do it is actually the other way you can plot things. Let's make this a little bigger. The other way you can plot things is you can mouse over the various parts of the circuit. For example, if I mouse over the wire, I see what's supposed to look like a little voltage probe there, and if I click on it, I see a plot of that voltage, which in this case is pretty unexciting because it's not changing. Uh, but if I mouse over a resistor, it tells me the direction it thinks is positive current, in this case pointed from right to left, but with that convention, it's a negative current. And if I click on it twice, I get rid of the other trace. So it's minus one amp, but with from right to left being positive current. In the same sense, this one has a positive current going up, and if I double click on it, I get a negative 1.5. And if I click on this one, that's from left to right, which is the direction I, draw, I drew it in my schematic. And when I plot on that, I get minus 0.5. So we see everything here matches the uh, solution we got in class as you would expect it to. For the next several examples, we're going to focus on this circuit that you've seen a couple of times. You first worked on it when Professor Tripathi gave the guest lecture, and you can find it in examples uh, page 11 and 12, and we also talked about it again under complex impedance, pages 40 and 41. We have a one microfarad capacitor in series with a 10 millihenry inductor. That gives a natural angular frequency of 10 to the fourth per second, which if we divide it by 2 pi, we get a frequency of 1591 hertz. You calculated that the critical damping resistance for this circuit is 200 ohms, and we calculated that a resistance of 1 ohm would give this a Q of 100. So let's make that circuit now. We'll shrink this and get it out of the way a little bit. Let's make that circuit in spice. So we start a new schematic. Go through the components. Let's start with the capacitor. The inductor, and notice I type inductor, not L, and it finds the inductor in the library. I rotate it to be the same orientation. I don't have to make my schematic here look like my schematic there, but it's a little less confusing if I keep them the same. Now I'll put in my ground point by using the net name. And we'll put it right here. And then I'll go through and connect some wires with draft wires. Now I'm going to go through and give things values. So again, click on the capacitor. I'm going to give it a value of one microfarad, but notice I could give it a lot of other properties. I could give it realistic properties of having a resistance or an inductance. I could also look one up from a manufacturer database and get the real values, but for now we'll just stick to a perfect capacitor. It's the same with an inductor. I'm going to give it a value of 10 millihenries, but I could give it lots of other properties or I could pick one from a library. Resistors are pretty much just resistors. Uh, I'm going to start out with the critical damping value that we calculated of 200 ohms. Um, I could give it a percentage uncertainty if I wanted to do a realistic model, but I'm going to keep it at exactly 200 ohms. Now I'm going to give my nets names. I'll label this one 1. And again, I don't have to do that, but it makes it a little less confusing. And looking forward to the next part of the simulation, I'm going to give this one a name of V out. Now I'm going to set up my spice directives. I'm going to start with initial conditions on the capacitor. So we're going to start with the dot initial condition that V of 1 equals 1 volt and control return, then we're going to tell it the analysis we want to do. And we want to do a time-based or transient analysis, .tran, 
in one microsecond increments out to 10 milliseconds. Now at this point, again, it's a good idea to save it, mostly because we don't want to crash and lose it, but we're also going to use this circuit again. And this is the last time we'll draw a circuit from scratch. We'll call it LRC. This is obviously not the first time I've done this. And now I'll run the simulation. Um, I get a little blank plot here. We'll pull it over here, make it a little bigger. And then what I want to do is look at the output. And we see that the voltage at the output drops quickly to ground. And we could also look at the voltage here. Now, that's critical damping. Now, let's play with this a little bit. We said that the critical damped resi resistor brought it as quickly to equilibrium as possible. So let's try increasing this resistance. Let's try increasing it to 500 ohms. And we'll run our simulation again, and we see that it takes a little longer to get down. Let's go out to 2K, so 10 times the critical value and we see that it returns to equilibrium quite slowly. Now let's go in the other direction. If critical damping was 200 ohms, let's set it to 100 ohms, so a little less than the critical damping value. Now we see that it oscillates a little bit around, around equilibrium. It didn't return directly to ground, it oscillates a little bit, but still quickly returns to equilibrium, to zero. Let's go a little less. Let's go to 550 ohms, so a quarter of the critical damping resistance. Now we get several wiggles out of it. We'll go down again to 10 ohms. We run it, and now we actually get quite a few wiggles, and it really starts to look like an oscillator before it finally dies mm -hmm. out. And finally, we'll go to the critical value of one, or sorry, the value of one ohm, which should give a Q of 100. So now if I run the simulation, it rings a lot. And in fact, it looks like maybe we want to go to a little longer time. So we right click on that and we change our 10 milliseconds to 50 milliseconds, run the simulation again and we see that it rings for a long time before coming to equilibrium. And of course, we could keep going. We could give this a, we could give this a value of a tenth of an ohm. And it just keeps ringing for a very long time. Now we're going to analyze the same circuit, but this time as a filter. So we're not going to start from scratch. We're going to open the schematic we just saved. So we'll bring up LT Spice, open LRC, and zoom out a little bit with the middle mouse track. And um, we're going to start just by moving this around to make it a filter. So I'm going to get rid of some traces. So we'll go to edit, edit, delete, get rid of that trace, get rid of that trace, get rid of that net. Then we're gonna move a couple things around. Move this over a little, move this over a little bit. this one and rotate it with control R. Then we're going to add a voltage source. Notice if you just drag with the mouse it moves the whole drawing. So we're going to add a voltage source. 
and wire it all up. Now voltage sources can be a lot more sophisticated than a DC voltage source. So we're going to go to advanced settings and instead of a DC value, we're going to make it a pulse. So we're going to have it start at zero, go to one volt. Now for a pulse, you have to give it a delay, a rise time, a fall time, and a time on. So we're going to have no delay. That is going to start right at t equals zero. You can't give it an infinite rise time or an infinite rise slope. So you have to give it a time. If you put zero here, it actually picks a pretty large number. So we're going to give it a one microsecond rise time, a one microsecond fall time, and a time on of five milliseconds. So let's go ahead and do that. Now we're going to go back. Let's go back to our critically damped circuit. So we're going to put a 200 ohm resistor here. Shrink this down so it fits a little better. Now we can take away our initial conditions because we could either put the initial condition at V1 is zero, but since there's no charge, that's the default. So we'll get rid of that one. Um, we'll go ahead and go back to our transient analysis from out to 10 milliseconds. And now we should save it because if I run it, it's going to automatically save it to this file, and we'd rather not overwrite that. So I'm going to save it as LRC filter. And we'll run the simulation, make the plot a little bit bigger, and now we'll plot V out. And you see at critical damping, we see it kind of goes up and then goes down. So it basically, whatever my driving pulse looks like, it returns to equilibrium. So we can also add what the driving pulse looked like. And it's kind of hard to see, but you can see it in blue here. And on this scale, it looks like it, it's infinitely fast. It's one microsecond on a 10 millisecond scale. So we see a one volt square pulse driving it. Now let's go to a very overdamped situation. Let's go to two kilo ohms here. Run the simulation again. You see we had a square impulse, but now it's starting to look, we don't really even see the effect of the inductor anymore. It just looks like a, basically a high pass filter. Now we can go out and look at the behavior over long times. If we go and change the time scale by right clicking there and going to say 50 milliseconds, run the simulation again, and we see we just had that one pulse and then it settles down. But I can also have the waveform send repeated pulses. So for example, I can give it a period of 10 milliseconds and then it'll send, just keep sending pulses. Oops. That's 10 seconds, make it 10 milliseconds. And we see we just get a string of pulses. Or I could have it send a few pulses and stop. I could say I want three pulses and then stop. and so on. So we'll go back to a short time scale. And now we'll start reducing our resistance again. We'll have, uh, let's go back to a little under damped. So now we see it rings a little bit every time the waveform changes. And then I'm going to keep going down in resistance. Go down to 10 ohms. Let's go through 50. 
And we have a little bit more ringing. And now we'll go down to 10. And now we see it rings a lot every time there's a pulse, but the amplitude is going down. And we could just keep going from there. If we go out to longer times, we see that every time the pulse wave changes, it rings, but now we really can't even see the difference between the waveform going up and the waveform going down. So let's go ahead and save that and end this part of the demonstration. For our final simulation, we're going to start with the same circuit and measure the response to frequency rather than the time domain response. So we'll go ahead and open the schematic we just created. And we're not actually going to change anything about the schematic. We're going to go in and edit the voltage supply. And we're going to get rid of we're going to get rid of this part about the pulse, and we're going to say small signal parameters. So this is the signal for um, AC analysis of the signal. So we're going to give it an amplitude, and we're going to say to show that information on the schematic instead of the other information. Now this information is still here, but we'll explain in a minute why it looks at this instead of this. So now it says it's got AC of 1 volt. And what we do is we change the analysis we do. We're going to go here, and instead of saying we want to do a transient analysis, we're going to do an AC analysis in decades. That means it's going to proceed logarithmically in a thousand, actually we're going to make it 10,000 points, from 100 hertz to 100 kilohertz. We could also say 100k here. And let's start with the critical damping frequency or resistance here, 200 ohms. So we're going to run a simulation. Let's make this plot a little bit bigger. And I'm going to look at B out. Now notice that we automatically, when I do an AC analysis, unless I tell it otherwise, it assumes I want decibels out. So it gives the output in decibels, but it also gives the uh, frequency, the phase shift. It'll automatically plot the phase shift relative to the input uh, voltage. Uh, so here we have the amplitude and the, freak, the phase shift going from about plus 90 to minus 90 and going through zero at the resonant frequency. Now, the critical damping frequency has a resistance gives it a very low Q. So let's start reducing the resistance and see what happens to this response. Let's go down to 100. We see it gets a little sharper, but also the transition between 90 degrees and minus 90 degrees gets a little bit sharper. So let's step down a little more, 50. Run it again. Now we're starting to get a narrower resonance. This transition gets a little narrower. Go to 10 ohms. Okay, now we're starting to see a really sharp peak and we're starting to see a really rapid change in the phase angle. And here we're going to go out to a resistance of 1 ohm, and remember that's a Q of 100. So if I were to take the peak, the frequency here over the dis difference at the 3 dB point, that would give me 100. 
So again, a high Q means I get a very narrow resonance. It also means the phase shift, the shift happens almost instantly. I stay at a 90 degree phase, which is essentially purely capacitor, driving the capacitor. Then as it goes through resonance, it goes through zero degrees. That's the one point where I'm driving just the resistor because the reactances here and here cancel out. And then in the end, it goes to minus 90 degrees, which means the capacitor is not important. I'm just driving the inductor. And again, I could go even further down to 0.1. And then I would get an extremely narrow resonance. And I could, for example, switch back to a linear range. And then it's really dramatic. If we go back to Q equals 100, you don't even really see, you barely see the difference. We'll go back to a linear range here. And you see in a linear plot, even if I go to the critical damping of 200, we'll run this again, it always defaults back to decibels. But if I plot this on a linear plot, it still looks like a reasonable peak if you plot it linearly. But remember, for example, if we were thinking about sound, you hear in decibels. And then if we go to sort of overdamped, let's say uh, 1K, then it gets really broad. And remember, your bandwidth again is going to be from this three decibel point to this three decibel point. If I go to linear plot, you know, it barely, now it's really looking like a band pass filter. That is, it's looking like it has a a high pass filter here at some low frequency and a low pass filter here at some high frequency. So this concludes the examples of using SPICE. Uh, in the next couple of homeworks, we'll be giving some homework problems in which you'll be expected to solve with SPICE, um, first analyzing filters similar to the one here that we've discussed in class, and then as we introduce more complex components like uh, diodes and transistors, you'll be asked to model those.